Hello all, my name is Owen Davis Bauer and presenting with me are Jack Taylor and Abby Felly. And we're gonna be presenting on our data analysis of hybrid monkey flower images. So just a little bit of background before we dive into this. Um, we were collaborating on this project with Dr. Cooley of Whitman's biology department and Dr. Cruzy of the College of William and Mary. Um, and they have ongoing research where they've been crossbreeding two different species of monkey flowers, which you can see at the bottom of the screen here. And their goal has been to study the spotting patterns that form on the petals of the hybrid flowers that you can see in the middle. Um, so their hypothesis is based on the idea of discrete spotting events to explain the spotting patterns, meaning that each spot um, comes from a discrete event that starts at the middle of the spot and extrudes outwards. Um, so they're interested in the number, size, and location of these spotting events on the petals. And they already had a data collection pipeline in place for this that works pretty well, um, but it spans across both MATLAB and Python and requires some manual correction for each spot image. So um, for our project, we were hoping to design some meaningful image processing and analysis tools to aid in their ongoing monkey flower research. Um, and some of our goals for this were to increase the data collection efficiency and accuracy and lower manual work and data collection, meaning that there's no need to go in and make manual corrections, um, as well as create a well-documented and easy to use pipeline in one technology, Python. And this is important because Obviously, we're not going to be able to continue working on this project after this year. Um, so we, we wanted to leave it somewhere where they could make additions or um, changes in the future. So now Abby will be talking about the pre-processing of the images that we did before anything else. Yeah, so our, we, we basically have two separate pipelines, but they since, since there's so much variety in the images that we got, um, there's there's some pre-processing that needs to happen before either of those pipelines can really get going. Here's here's a here's a some of the differences between the images include different different colors, different color spaces. Like some of them are in black and white, some of them are in full color. There are different size images. Some images have more than one petal per image, so here you can get an idea of the kind of variety that we deal with. So the first thing, or the first issue is that we want to convert our images from color to black and white, partly because some of the images that we're going to con compare to are in grayscale already, and partly because reducing the dimensionality of our image arrays from three to one reduces the amount of data that we have to analyze and thus the amount of time that our, our algorithms take by quite a bit. We also, mo this is also why most processing libraries, most image processing libraries use grayscale images. And it's, we don't, we don't, yeah. Next slide. So between the petal images, there's not really a constant size because they've been taken by different labs and like it at, with different cameras at different angles, or not at different angles, but at different distances. Um, because our image processing pipeline compares individual pixels, we need them to have about the same number of pixels. And again, we prefer to reduce the amount of data that we have to process in the interests of time. So we shrink the images. Um, an important aspect of image resizing is that we want the aspect ratio to maintain the same so we don't get this stretched out version that you see here. Um, I think what we basically what we ended up doing is resizing one image to match the width of another image and just hoping that the height approximates to about the same and it does work fairly well. Side. The, the final thing is these images with three petals per image. We, we built a tool that will that uses image segmentation 
to find the edges of the pedal objects and we use that to get all of the different pedals in different different images since we're studying them separately. Um, so now we're going to start talking about the spot detection pipeline. Um, so this is similar to the pipeline that they already had in place. Um, we decided to start from fresh, um, from scratch and rewrite the pipeline um, from the beginning, just because first of all, it, it taught us a lot about kind of everything going on throughout the process. And um, we also, there were some things that we wanted to approach differently. Um, so to, to talk about this, we have to talk about what we call spotting events. Um, and here's an example down here at the bottom of a spotting event. So these can be modeled as circles starting in the middle and expanding outwards, like I've mentioned before. And this is very important when we get into our Gaussian mixture model, which is trying to predict exactly where these circles will be. And Jack will be talking about that later. Um, our current understanding is that the spotting patterns form somewhat randomly. On the right side, you can see two different spotting pa patterns, which seem or are obviously very different. Um, and what the biologists are interested in learning is how and why these spots form um, where they're forming. Um, so to do spot detection, we're trying to look at an image of a petal and pick out every place where a spotting event occurs. So in a perfect scenario, this is kind of what we would look for as an outcome, where each of these spots are being approximated by a spotting event with a size and location. Um, but obviously, this is a more difficult task than just looking at the image and picking out the um, spotting events. So some of our challenges were overlapping spots where, as you can see here, we have multiple spots overlapping each other that can't just be approximated by one single spotting event. And there's some ambiguity right between um, how the sub spots are going to make up that larger um, spot. And there are a number of ways this could go. Another challenge that we dealt with is spots on the edge of the petal. And this is something that the biologists were previously um, treating as a spot that was centered right on the edge and would just expand outwards to whatever the radius of the spot was. Um, but this was a, a tricky thing for us to do and we didn't get as close to this as we would like to just because it would require knowing exactly where the edge is, um, which is something we could add in the future. All right, so the solution to the spot detection problem pipeline has three main components that chain together to find the spots. The first is a technique called principal component analysis. And we then use the results of that to create a spatial data scatter plot, which we can feed into our Gaussian mixture model and use to find the spots. So here's the image that we're going to be following along the pipeline. So the first step is principal component analysis. If so, the, the graph here represents the pixels of the previous image. Uh, but but just charted in, in 3D color space, so you can see that they're all kind of floating in there. Um, principal component analysis allows us to find the axis for the data that will preserve the largest amount of variance and the second most, the second largest amount of variance that's orthogonal to the first, which we don't need to get into. So we're gonna, we're gonna so the first principal component is that, that longest line that I've drawn on there. And basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna use that to convert our image to grayscale in a way that preserves more variance of the data by projecting all of the data onto that line, essentially just finding the point on the line that's the closest to a given data point and assigning it to that point instead. Uh, we'll see what that looks like on the next slide. So on the left, we have just the grayscale image that's produced by the normal conversion function. 
if you remember that that box from earlier, this is the grayscale image that you get if you projected it along that middle that middle axis. But when we project it on our better axis, we get the image on the right. And you can see that it maps the palest colors in the image to white and the darkest colors to gray, even though the normal grayscale conversion algorithm would just map them all to sort of brownish. And this makes a much clearer image. So now that we've converted it to grayscale, each of the pixels is just represented by one number. And we use that number to represent the image as a scatter plot of spatial data points by so first we threshold out all the points that are not red since basically all the darkest pixels will have the highest grayscale values or the lowest so we just take away all of the ones that are below that and keep all the ones that are above that and then we also use that number as the number of scatter plot points at the position. So that enables us to preserve some of the, the depth of color that you get in the middle of the spots as point density. And that allows us to use the Gaussian mixture model, which Jack will explain. Okay, so um, obviously like the biggest part of this pipeline is creating circles that we can put on top of our various uh, data, pl data plots so that way we can um, determine when the, where the spotting events are happening. And to do so, we use something called a Gaussian mixture model. Without going too much into the math of how those work, a Gaussian mixture model is a probability density function that is composed of many individual Gaussian distributions. Um, and those Gaussian distributions for our purposes will represent these circles that we are trying to find. Um, and the reason we use a Gaussian mixture model is because we can uh, change the size and location of Gaussians really easily. As you can see by this graph on the side, um, using different parameter values for mu and sigma square really changes uh, how the Gaussians will look in terms of their general location and their width which is really good for us because we'll have a lot of different size circles, obviously in a bunch of different areas. So what we wanna be able to do then is find the appropriate parameters to best fit our data with these Gaussians. But first, there is um, an important uh, thing to be explained. Obviously, um, those bell-shaped curves that you just saw, those are not circles. So you're probably wondering, how those will represent our circles. And essentially, the thing is with those uh, Gaussians before, they were plotted over one dimensional data across a line and fitted to data like that. However, our data is spatial, so it's across two dimensions, the x and y direction. So um, therefore, our Gaussians will actually be in three dimensionals rather than two, -dimensional, two dimensions. And um, so you can visualize this as before we had those bell-shaped curves. If you were to rotate those around and create a shell of the shape, you'd get uh, that this 3D thimble-shaped sort of thing, as you can see in the bottom right here. And then if you were to look at that from the top down, which we're trying to do with our x, y dimensions anyway, you will in fact get circles like you see on the left here. Uh, and so because of that, what we're really trying to do is we're trying to figure out how we can center those circles and uh, determine their width so they will best fit our data. And to do that, we will use an algorithm that is called the expectation maximization or EM algorithm. The way this works is we're going to start by randomly placing some number of Gaussians on our scatter plot, And then we're going to iterate through the following two steps. First, we're going to estimate how well our Gaussians fit our data. And um, then we are going to change the parameters of our Gaussians so that way they better model that probability of how well they're fitting the data to better fit the 
And on the right, you can see graphically kind of how this algorithm will work. The, the first picture is the initialization step where we kind of randomly place our Gaussians. In this case, we have two Gaussians, one that's yellow and one that's blue. And you can see the data points across the line um, are shaded differently of yellow and blue to uh, show how much they are a part of each of the two distributions. The ones that are closer to the yellow that will, ha will have more yellow, and the ones that are closer to the blue will have more blue. And obviously in this first image, a lot of the points are just not covered by the Gaussians at all, which is why we then re-parameterize them accordingly, accordingly, which we can see in the second image. Uh, the Gaussians there are fitting the data a lot better. However, they are still not fitting the data great by any means. There are a few points, in particular X2 you can see, just kind of falls at the tail end of both Gaussians, which is not something that we want because it's not really covered by either of them. So that's why we repeat those second two steps because in the third iteration, you can see that um, both Gaussians now cover the points a lot better. And ideally, we'll keep doing this process until we reach something called convergence, which is where every iteration after that will be the same parameters as our current iteration. And when we have that happen, that's when we know that we have the best fit for our data. Uh, but with using an algorithm like this comes a lot of trade-offs in terms of performance versus accuracy. In general, the concept is if you're working with a few things, then you don't have to perform as many operations, so your program will work a lot faster. But if you're, whereas if you're working with a lot of things, you're not generalizing the problem as much, so you'll get a lot more accurate results. And some situations where we see this affect our um, algorithm is first with the number of iterations that we run. Um, as I mentioned, we have to keep iterating ideally until we hit um, convergence. But sometimes that takes a lot longer, and we might get a decent approximation anyway with fewer iterations. And the less iterations you do, obviously, the faster you'll hit results. So that's pretty nice. Um, the second one is image size. From the earlier images, you could see that um, you would have some large blotches of points, kind of close to smaller blotches of points. And by the nature of the probability distributions, when there isn't that much distance between those two blotches, the smaller one is just going to be um, absorbed into the Gaussians of the bigger one, which we don't want because we don't really want any of the white space to uh, be modeled after, by the Gaussians. So when we have bigger images, um, the distance between each blob is actually further, so we don't have that issue as much. But with bigger images as well, we need to process a lot more data, which will take a lot longer. Similarly with point density, as Abby was talking about before, points that are um, much more um, pigmented, we want to give more density value to, because those points are more likely to be close to the center of a spotting event. And so when we're modeling our, our Gaussians off of that, it is very nice to be able to uh, have those points matter more. However, the more points we put in one place is the more data we have to process through each iteration and calculate the probabilities for. So that will make it take longer, but again, will be more accurate. And here's a simple example of how that trade-off will work. On the left, we have an image that is 25 by 300, and on the right, we have an image that is 50 by 400. So the image on the right is bigger. Um, and you can see that some of the circles, especially on the corners, actually do end up fitting the data somewhat better and like closer than uh, the one on the left does. So that's pretty nice. Um, and then additionally, the one on the right doesn't have certain circles for edge points where the circles are actually not really well measuring the uh, spotting events. Like you can tell that like there's multiple spotting events that are being mapped as one spotting event and we don't want that. So it's better to avoid that completely. Um, so yeah, the bigger one is better. However, in generating th these images, I can tell you uh, it took a lot, lot longer to render the one on the right than the one on the left. Oh, so here's an overview of the whole spot detection pipeline. 
from the original image to the grayscale used by principal component analysis, and then to take that into spatial data points, which we can then use to find the spots with our Gaussian mixture model, and which gives us this final result. Which is, here it is big. Look at all those little circles on the circles. All right, so the next thing we're gonna talk about is vein alignment. And one cool thing about our project, since we were working with researchers, um, with ongoing research, is that the, some of the requirements or think, tools that they needed shifted as we worked. Um, and so this came up in one meeting. They had a problem where the Pusey lab is trying to find some kind of correlation between the location of spots and the veins of the petals. And to do this, they take the original petal, they take an image of it, and then they perform some kind of chemical filtering to it to allow them to get a really nice crisp image of all these um, petal veins here. And so what they do at that point is they try and manually go in and overlay the um, vein image over the petal image. And as you could imagine, if you've ever worked around with some kind of photo editing where you're trying to move an image around and rotate it to fit a certain size, that takes a lot of kind of tweaking. And while it may be feasible to do for one image, if you're trying to process a whole ton of data like this, that could become very time consuming. And we thought this could be a great application for some kind of software solution to align these images itself. All right, so for our vein alignment pipeline, we start off by doing something similar to the PCA that we did in the previous pipeline with our k-means clustering. After that, we uh, found the relevant shapes that we need of each image, i.e. like the general outline of the vein image and the general outline of the petal image. And then we were able to find how these images were uh, positioned differently by way of using a function and estimating that function. And then by using that function, we were actually able to fit the shapes to each other. So it was very easy to overlay one on top of the other and get the vein alignment that we wanted. Oh, okay, so the first step in this pipeline is k-means clustering, which we essentially use to simplify the initial image that we get. Um, so these, these pictures are a demonstration of k-means clustering in just over regular scatter, scatter plot data, which is in two dimensions. Our data is in three dimensions because it's in color space. Um, but we're just gonna look at this because it's easier to have pictures of. So like the expectation maximization that Jack talked about, k-means clustering is an iterative algorithm. Uh, in k-means clustering, you decide ahead of time how many clusters there are, and you feed that into your, your Python program or you calculate it yourself. Uh, it, 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 you, the first step is that the K cluster centers are randomly initialized, like in this first picture. And then based on the cluster centers, all of your data points are assigned to the cluster with the closest center. And then, so that's picture two. And then, eh, and then based on the, the clusters that you now have, you find the new best center for each cluster, which is defined as the centroid, which has a specific meaning that we're not gonna get into. And then you repeat those two steps until you get to convergence, which is just, you've got the best clustering. And in our case, that enables us to take our initial image with many color values and take it to an image with only three color values. And then when we convert it to black and white, it's very simple and easy to find the shape of. So here's what the images look like after the pre-processing going into the vein alignment pipeline. 
All right. So after that, we will start talking about, we will start like um, trying to extract the shapes that we want and try to match them to each other. So that way they're easy to overlay, um, overlay on top of each other. Um, one of the biggest challenges with this is that one of the inconsistencies between images that we have is that the ratio of background to actual petal in an image can vary greatly between two images. And um, in typical image alignment techniques, we're like trying to align based off of the full image. However, we don't want that for this. We really only care about aligning the two shapes. The rest of the background image does not matter to us. So um, one thing that we need to focus on with that is that while our images right now are the same size, that does not mean that the two uh, petal shapes will be the same size. So we actually need to uh, go back and uh, resize the images so that way the petal shapes sizes match more than the actual image sizes. And then after that, um, we'll still have two very different objects. If um, you recall from the initial pictures, we have one petal that is a solid yellow or a solid gray with darker gray spots on it. And the other one is a straight up black and white uh, image with just a bunch of vein patterns. And while it's very clear to see from the human eye that these two images are related, um, for a computer, they are very different. One is a solid shape, whereas the other is a collection of a bunch of lines. So a computer trying to like analyze those two shapes for similarities is very difficult. And so we had to be able to regularize the format of both so that way they were easier to compare. Um, and to do so, we uh, decided that we wanted just to have kind of like an inkblot test kind of picture with a black background and then um, a white silhouette of each of the shapes. So that way they would look uh, closer to the same. And the algorithm we used to do this is called the flood fill algorithm. Essentially, the flood fill algorithm starts at a certain point of interest. For us, that will be a point of color. And... Um, from there, we'll look at a bunch of its neighbors and find how many of those neighbors are the same and how many of those neighbors are different. And essentially the flood fill algorithm at each iteration will change a certain amount of close neighbors that are different to the same until it hits a point where it's changing too many. Um, this algorithm worked really well to get the shape of the actual petal image, but for the vein image where a lot of the neighbors were different colors, i.e. black rather than white, it was very hard to get super close shading results, as you'll see in the next slide. Um, so on the left is the petal image, which silhouetted really perfectly. On the right is the vein image, where you can see some of the middle that we'd want to be shaded in did not get shaded in. And some of the boundaries, especially in that top left corner, uh, started to become white, which we didn't want at all. And so essentially, we had to approximate a certain good enough place where the two shapes looked similar enough to compare without overdoing it for that vein shape. And we um, found that most results that were good enough looked something like two shapes similar like this. So next, now that we have our two shapes, we want to be able to translate them so that way they look the same. And in theory, there are two major types of translations that can occur between objects and an image. Those two are Euclidean transformations and affine transformations. Uh, Euclidean transformations are the kind of transformations that you'd see on your traditional X, Y, Euclidean plane. Uh, you have your rotations, your translations, and your resizing. Um, and then affine transformations instead also offer a third dimension, which allows you to rotate the image in a different uh, way than just the simple x, y rotation. Um, for general purposes, the affine transformation would have been better. However, for our images, which are all taken from top down, they are all on pretty much a two-dimensional plane already. So we could actually just use the Euclidean algorithm, which is a nice thing to be able to use because it runs much quicker. And the way that um, the Euclidean motion calculation works is that we have these two shapes, and we assume that there's a function of some form like ax plus by plus c that will translate one shape into the other shape 
And so the goal of this algorithm is then to estimate our parameters A, B, and C so it fits that the closest. And then we will get that function output it back to us. And from there, we can apply that function to one of the two shapes and then they will be um, aligned in the same way. So then uh, we get to our overall pipeline where we start with our original images. We pre-process and do the k-means clustering on our petal image. We flood fill them. And then finally, we translate and overlay them as such in the final results. Um, the final result uh, in a bigger image looks like this. As you can see, the veins map very well on top of the actual petal. And this is sufficient for our purposes. Okay, now we're just going to briefly move on to the methods and outcomes. I noticed we're a little tight on time. Um, one interesting decision that we made pretty early on was to use third party libraries for a lot of the algorithm implementations. Um, the main reason we did this was to save time that we would have spent implementing these algorithms and be able to apply that into other things. Um, and this turned out to work really well for us because there was some amount of trial and error with different algorithms. So we would try a, diff a certain algorithm and realize maybe it doesn't fit exactly what we're looking for in our pipeline and need to swap it out for something else. And you can imagine that if we had to put all that time into developing and testing that algorithm only to scrap it, that's a lot of wasted time that we probably should have been working on something else. Um, the obvious downsides of using third party libraries is that in the process, we picked up some technical debt, which essentially means that we knew kind of what the algorithms were doing, but we didn't know all the nitty gritty details that we may have been able to optimize um, the rest of our pipeline for. And so when we're making changes on the pipeline or trying to fix a bug or something, we might have to go back and relearn a little bit more about the implementation of the um, library algorithm before actually making that fix. Um, and the other thing, the other con is that we lost a little bit of ownership in, able, in being able to customize some of these algorithms to specifically match our needs. And we may have been able to make them a little bit more efficient because of that. Um, I'll go quickly through what we learned. Um, we learned a lot about developing solutions for an ongoing project or ongoing research where there are some like changing requirements. Um, and we had to be very flexible to be able to kind of move in different directions at any given time. Um, we obviously learned a lot about image processing and the math behind it. And then the most interesting thing for me was um, learning about cross-disciplinary communication as we were collaborating with people in the biology department who knew a lot about biology, um, but maybe not as much about the computer side of things that, that we were focused on. So there, there is some work going into um, kind of translating what they wanted from what we were able to do and stuff like that. And then lastly, we'll just briefly talk about the next steps that we would have liked to do if we had more time. Um, the first one would be to expand the vein alignment pipeline to actually look for the correlation with the spotting events. Um, as we saw earlier, we can already output where those spotting events happen but we don't really know where the actual veins are. And as this is something that they're doing manually, it would be a good thing to apply if we could. Um, and then the second one is um, on some images, and obviously this is a more complicated pedal than many. Um, we have some um, instances where on these larger spots, we might be estimating a few more spotting events than should actually be there. And then we're, we also had some difficulty picking up edge spots, as Jack mentioned earlier. And lastly, I'd like to thank Professor Stratton for kind of guiding us throughout the whole project um, and kind of pointing us in the right direction if we were getting stuck, as well as um, Professor Cooley and Puzi, who were a lot of fun to work with. And I think we all learned a lot about um, biology and flowers from them. So thank you. Any questions? Yeah, so we already have uh, um, one question, which was uh, going back to the description of the Gaussian mixture model and expectation maximization. Uh, there's a 
uh, there's a classical problem in clustering, which is if you know how many clusters there are, they're relatively easy to find. But how do you accommodate a situation like this where it might not be easy to determine how many clusters there are ahead of time? Um, so uh, we kind of generalized what we did in this presentation, but in reality, to solve this problem, we actually use like um, a Bayesian estimator as well which allowed us to start with a high number of clusters. And then um, using some other probability tactics, we were able, it, the um, algorithm automatically removed um, certain Gaussians that were not seen as relevant enough. And so we just kind of overestimated the amount of Gaussians we needed and let the algorithm do the work to get down to less Gaussians that were more appropriate. Yeah, and that threshold that Jack mentioned is something that we were able to set in there. So if we noticed that it was cu cutting out too many um, spotting events, perhaps we were missing some, then we could um, lower that threshold so that we were removing less um, potential spotting events. Um, and so was that Bayesian model that you talked about something that you came up with yourself or is it something that was kind of built into the literature or work that people had already done? Uh, yeah, no, it's a common variant of the um, uh, Gaussian mixture model, which is just called the Bayesian Gaussian mixture model. We were lucky enough that it was also implemented in OpenCV or in scikit-learn, excuse me which is the library we were using for our Gaussian mixture models. Yeah, great. Um, so we have another question uh, with the comment that, you know, detecting spots along the edges is, you know, just hard to do in general. Uh, do you have any thoughts about, you know, next steps about getting even more accurate results for uh, some of those clusters or spotting yeah. events? Yeah. Um, oh, and if you could go to the um, the point cloud with the uh, circles on it. Uh, yeah. So um, one thing that I have been considering doing, and I'm kind of just working on for fun right now, is um, so as I mentioned before, with the trade offs of accuracy with the distance between larger points and smaller points, is that a lot of smaller points uh, will not get accurately represented, especially the ones on the edge, because of their um, proximity to larger ones. So um, one solution that uh, we've been considering is to window our, our data points and make them smaller so that way um, uh, certain smaller blotches will not actually be in the same uh, Gaussian mixture model as the larger ones. And um, doing so will allow it to be modeled much more on an individual level and um, that will potentially help get more circles for them. Additionally, um, as Abby mentioned, we use PCA to threshold out certain values. Um, because they're thresholded in such a way, we could actually um, include the gray background without including um, the yellow petal parts. And by doing so, we can figure out where there are certain edge spotting events that are, rather than being a center spotting event, if they're touching those gray, those other like uh, gray table values. Mm -hmm. um, and by doing that, we can um, fix our estimation to like look more in a different center. Mm 